Well, today marks 50 years since Title IX was signed into law. The landmark civil rights law was passed to give women the same access to sports as men. And two-time Olympic gold medalist and women's World Cup winner Brianna Scurry knows what it's like to break those barriers. She was the U.S. women's national team's goalkeeper for 14 years, who also made uh, her mark as the only black openly gay player on the field until a concussion changed her life forever. She tells that story in her brand new memoir, The Greatest Save. She's also the subject of an upcoming documentary called The Only on Paramount Plus, which, like CBS, is a division of Paramount Global. Here's a preview. One of the greatest we've ever seen, not just in the U.S., but in the world. My kick is insignificant if she doesn't make a save. She was the right goalkeeper at the right time. When I look back, I feel like I've always been the only. The only girl, the only black kid, the only openly gay player. Even on the field, I was the only one that could save us. But the real challenge was saving myself. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that gives us so many questions <laughs> to ask. A Hall of Fame member, Brianna Scurry, is also an analyst for uh, Paramount Plus Soccer coverage, and she is here with us now in Studio 57. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you for having um, me. We were just talking before this, and I was saying almost every little girl I know is part of a soccer team. Yes. Um, soccer has been exceptional in getting girls passionate about the sport. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, things pivot. It seems like not just soccer, but other sports are sure. not as accepting. What more needs to be done so that other people don't say, I'm the only, that right. to be, for, for the sport to be more open mm -hmm. for black women? Well, the issue in soccer is three things. Mm -hmm. um, location, um, most of the soccer community is urban. Um, excuse me, is suburban, suburban and not yep. urban. Second is economics. Um, it's incredibly expensive to play, to get your kid going, and to even have a continuation. It's, it's a lot of money, yeah. and you have to make tough decisions. The third is the gatekeepers, the people who decide the system and how youth players come through it. Um, are they looking at African-American players and women of color? Are they not? It depends on how those people perceive them. And so those three things are really big factors. And, and unfortunately, um, it's been a problem, but hopefully now it, it'll, it'll re resolve itself. Yeah. And what's remarkable to me is that as challenging as it is to get into the sport, to do well, um, and to be a top athlete, you've done all of that, yeah. but you also dealt with a career-ending injury. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the flip side of the success, right? Yes. The damage, mm -hmm. the damages, right. the, the impact on identity. Mm -hmm. I know you write about this um, mm -hmm. in your book, but where do you find the strength to persevere despite all those challenges, despite, as you say, being the only? I think my strength came from my mom and dad. They were huge um, supporters of me, and I was very lucky in that regard. I wanted to be an Olympian since I was eight years old, and they really nurtured that dream. And as I went through the system, I was really aware of what I needed to do and, and my path to get there. And all the things I learned from playing team sports, I played four sports in high school, and all the advantages and, and the things I learned, resilience was one of them. Mm -hmm. And so when things were going great, I was able to stay on top of the mountain and it was wonderful. But when things weren't going so well, I was able to um, call upon that resilience that I had learned and, and get through it. Was there a specific message or story? Because as you say, when you're not doing well, especially right. if you're dealing with an injury that could threaten your career and yes. you're thinking about, well, what else can I possibly do? I've given everything yes. for this. Right. What was the key to that resilience? So for me, it really was um, when I was very depressed during my concussion situation was three years long. So in 2013, I was really struggling and um, I, com I thought about committing suicide. I contemplated it. Wow. And I remember thinking, I can't do this because someone will have to inform my mother that her baby is gone. Mm -hmm. And that thought kept me from doing it. And then as time went on, I was thrown a lifeline by a great friend, Naomi Gonzalez, telling my future wife, Chrissa Zizos, about my plight with the insurance company, and Chrissa owns a PR firm. And so she threatened the insurance company with some not so nice press, and they decided to do the right thing. And ever since then, I've been on the upswing. And so that person wow. coming into my life truly saved me. And, and someone um, like Naomi, um, you know, sticking up for me and, and deciding to say something um, really helped me. I mean, there's so many aspects of your story. There's so many different ways I yes. can go down. But <laughs> sure. I am sort of really interested in 
the period of time when you were depressed because yes. I because I just feel like there's so many people struggle with depression mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of misconceptions about what it looks like right. and I think people need to see mm -hmm. that you can come out on the other side and yeah. be sitting here um, but I wondered in a sports environment mm -hmm. was there an understanding mm -hmm. about what depression is or was mm -hmm. it kind of like suck it up get tough that's mm -hmm. what you know athletes do well that's one of the reasons why I'm doing advocacy I'm trying to change the culture of, you know, just rub some dirt on it and keep on going, just mm -hmm. shake it off. Because when it comes to head injury, that's the one injury you cannot push through. Mm -hmm. And so part of my advocacy is around that. And when I played, you know, in, in the early 2000s, um, we didn't know a lot about head injuries. Head injuries were a black box. And when we did learn, it was all NFL players and, and they didn't talk about the emotional part of it. And yeah. so that's what I do. I talk about the emotional side. And to think you've got that going on, um, but for a long time you were the only openly gay player on the women's national team. We're, yes. we're speaking during Pride Month. Right. And as you watch the landscape out there, there's a lot of people that are still resistant to this idea of mm -hmm. gay pride and yeah. people being their, their true and authentic selves. Right. Um, you say your former teammate, uh, Abby Wambach, or she says, you pave the way yeah. for players like her to be themselves. Yeah. How'd you do that? <laughs> uh, first of all, I was absolutely astonished when she said that because yeah. I didn't know that I had that impact on her. And so I was just honored that she, she said that. I think I was just being who I was. I've always been just who I am all the time. I've been very authentic and, and, and willing to just forge my path ahead. And that included with my, my color, obviously, but also my sexuality. And I was um, you know, forced, in my mind, forced to just be who I am and to be a trailblazer and to be a great example. And fortunately, um, you know, it's, it's come and, and it's gotten better for a lot of us, um, Abby included, Megan Rapino, a lot of comfortable, openly gay players on the team now. And so I was the only during my time. But also I want to say that my teammates were fantastic mm. about me and with me. And I never felt like I was excluded from anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great story, um, and I cannot wait to watch it on Paramount Plus <laughs> and read the book. Thank you, uh, Brianna Curry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can stream the documentary, Anne Marie, and everybody else mm -hmm. on Paramount Plus, beginning July twelfth.